Thank you, Helen. And uh, <clears throat> many thanks to Helen and Matt for hosting my wife, Laura, who's in the back there, and I for the last uh, couple days. Uh, thank the Bowen Center for inviting me to come and give this presentation. Oh, sorry. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so my talk today is, is uh, about climate and climate change, but it's deep time, probably much further back than any of you are particularly familiar with. Um, I'll be talking about the Cretaceous Age. Um, I give age intervals uh, so that you know, if I say Maastrichtian, you at least know what the age is and things like that. Um, and I'm trying to give this at a level that um, general audience understands. I understand you're not all paleoceanographers. Um, please ask a question anytime if you don't understand something. The talk is going to be in two parts. The first part will talk about the climate curve that we have reconstructed for the high latitudes uh, for the Cretaceous age. And um, so I'll go into what, how we constructed that climate curve and then the implications of that. The second part we'll talk about an ocean drilling expedition on which I participated um, one year ago. And that the reason is relevant to this talk is because the purpose for that expedition was to fill in gaps for the climate curve. And so um, if after the first part you are, feel like you're done, I won't feel offended if you want to get up and leave. Um, but actually, the two talks it should go together pretty well. I start with this slide uh, because I think it's a really neat, interesting juxtaposition of modern day ice house climate in Antarctica. Uh, in Seymour Island, which is in the Northeast Antarctic Peninsula. The Cretaceous sediments are in the background. Um, and this is where I did my master's thesis work. These sediments dip eight degrees to the east. We've got a record from the west end of the island that goes up through the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary uh, from about 74 million years up to about 55 million years ago, going this direction. So I was a young graduate student when I went there camping in tents for three field seasons, collecting through the sequence. And the thing that really struck me, um, how do we advance, actually? How do we advance the page? So just hit this. OK. Yeah, OK, very good. <clears throat> so the location where we worked is Seymour Island here with the Cretaceous sediments on it. It's in the Antarctic Peninsula here, 65 degrees south. And just as an aside, this is a location where the Nordenskjold expedition visited in 1901 to 1903. The Swedish North Polar Expedition built their hut right here, and they spent most of their time collecting from Seymour Island. And they went there because whalers brought back fossil wood and ammonites, evidence of a very different earth. And there was interest to find out more about this location. So for two years, the Northern Scroll Expedition was here. They collected from Seymour Island and the fact that we found fossil wood in Antarctica was quite dramatic at the time of this expedition. And of course, when you're working there and it's very, very cold, and you see fossil wood, and you find plesiosaur bones, which is an extinct swimming reptile, cold-blooded, it tells you it was a much warmer climate. So from the beginning of my research, I've always had a, a deep interest in understanding Cretaceous climate. As Helen mentioned, uh, the focus of my talk will be about foraminifera. And these are single-celled organisms that make a shell. There's two kinds. Benthic lives in the seafloor. Planktic's floated. They're in the ocean today, and they have a fossil record going back uh, into the Jurassic, in fact, uh, for the planktic foraminifera. This is an, a slide of Eocene foraminifera. 
with many planktic foraminifera and one benthic foraminifera. And so these are the shells that accumulate that are very useful for telling geologic age, but also, as Helen mentioned, analy chemical analysis of the shells allows reconstruction of temperatures. So the goals for this part of the talk is to reconstruct the Cretaceous climate history um, from high paleolatitudes. By high, I mean on the order of 60 to 62 degrees south paleolatitude. And so we want to look at how the temperatures changed, what were the maximum temperatures, and then at what time did temperatures warm versus cool. Based on this, from the high latitudes, we are interested in whether or not it was cool enough to support continental ice sheets in Antarctica. In particular, there are Cretaceous sea level curves that many people have said in the past must be caused, the sea level changes must have been caused by ice, ice sheet growth and decay. So the question is, did those ice sheets exist to cause sea level changes? And then we want to understand, okay, if climate changed, what were the forcing mechanisms for those changed? What drove Cretaceous climate shifts? So we'll talk about stable isotopes, and this is the chemistry of the shells of the foraminifera. And we will express this in the del O18 values. And the oxygen isotopes are affected by salinity, but in the open ocean, salinity stays the same. So we don't have to worry about ocean salinity because it's, we assume it's constant. Mostly, the signal tells us water temperature. And as oxygen isotope values become more negative, that indicates warming. As they become more positive, it indicates cooling. And of course, the planktic foraminifera, which float at the surface, give you the warmer temperatures. The benthics give you the bottom water temperatures. So this is a very powerful tool for reconstructing ancient climate. As we go back further in time, we have to be concerned about preservation of the shells. The ideal preservation is this very pristine shell wall with the pores perfectly preserved, nice layering of the shell. This particular shell is actually 99 million years old, yet it's still perfectly preserved because it was deposited in clay-rich sediment. This shell shows recrystallization, which means the pore water has slightly changed the chemistry of the shell. So oxygen isotopes from a shell like that are going to be a little bit changed. This shell is completely filled in with calcium carbonate. And that calcium carbonate completely changes the signal. And so you can't really trust a signal that's infilled like this. This shell is just dirty. The shell itself is OK, but it's just infilled with matrix. So you clean your forams, and then you get a, a fine signal. The locations that I'll talk about where we're getting our temperature curves are shown in this map, reconstructed for 92 million years ago. Australia is up against Antarctica. India is in the southern Indian Ocean. Here is Kerguelen Plateau. And then South America and Africa are closer to Antarctica as well. So all these sites were around 60, 62 degrees south. In particular, I'm going to focus on these two sites in the Southeast Indian Ocean. That uh, site, these sites were drilled in 1972 by Deep Sea Drilling Project. And the drilling was incomplete, so the record was incomplete. <clears throat> this shows the Cretaceous record. The black represents sediment that was recovered from the coring from the drill ship. The white and the diamond pattern represents unrecovered intervals. So we have very brief intervals where we can get data. Nonetheless, my colleague Ken McLeod and I analyze the benthics, shown as diamonds, and the planktics, shown as the circles and the crosses and in uh, triangles. Starting in the late Albion, which is on the order of, of um, 100 million years ago, our benthic temperatures are shown here, planktics here. We see that they're pretty consistent until we get to the Tronian, which is this age here, where we get values of minus 3.5 per mil. 
And when you can reconstruct the temperature of those values, at 60 degrees south, the temperature would be on the order of 30 degrees centigrade at 60 degrees south. So the benthic temperatures here, you can see they shift to warming here, increase to 18 to 20 degrees centigrade in middle baffle depths. So we're going from a warm climate to an extremely hot climate. But you can see there's lots of gaps in the record. Um, so there's details that are not in this record. Nonetheless, it's these data that were the basis for constructing a proposal for ocean drilling to fill in these gaps. And I'll talk about that in the second part of the talk. Notice that the temperatures stay, stay very warm, and then they start to cool up here and become more positive, um, which means cooling. Preservation of the foraminifera is really nice all the way through. And so you can see beautiful shell preservation here, nice shell preservation here. And so these are reliable data from the southern Indian Ocean. And what I did with those temperatures, I went back to all the sites where we've got noxious isotope data from the southern South Atlantic as well and reconstruct new age models to provide age constraints for all the data that have been published in the past, particularly data I've published but also colleagues have published. So this is the age depth curve using a combination of calcareous nanofossils, foraminifera, and paleomagnetics. And the point of showing these graphs is that we actually have quite well resolved age determinations for all these different sites, which means every core sample we get, we can get a pretty reliable age uh, for those samples. So once we've done that, then I've plotted all the data on a common curve for the southern Indian Ocean, shown in red, and then the southern South Atlantic, shown in the orange and these colors here. So again, if we start back at the older part of the curve, this is 114 million years ago where the data start. We've got the benthic data, which are diamonds, and these are the temperatures here, 10 degrees C. So it's warm relative to today. And you see slight warming as we get into about 104 million years ago. And then we've got a big gap with no data because of the drilling recovery was, was not good. Notice we've got this abrupt shift from the warm temperatures to really hot temperatures right here, right across the Cinnamanian Tronian boundary at about 94 million years ago. So a big shift here. And then notice the Atlantic data stay warm. The Indian Ocean data start to cool. But the warmest values are more than 30 degrees centigrade. Again, to remind you, this is at 60 to 62 degrees south with temperatures this warm. Also, at this time, this is when we've got dinosaurs in Antarctica and fossil forests. So we know from the fossils that it was warm this is telling us it was almost tropical. So it's kind of alarming because climate models cannot model these kind of warm temperatures. So the big question is, how abrupt was this shift? Uh, did it happen very quickly? Um, and was it because of volcanism? Or what caused that temperature warming? But we have that big data gap, and so we need context for that warming. Work with Karen Bice back in, uh, published in 2003. We looked at uh, southern South Atlantic data, Site 511, Falcon Plateau. And we took apart the warming event with the different planktic species up here. These are the benthic species. And we see that it's a surface water warming in the South Atlantic. Again, look at how warm these temperatures are. Very abruptly getting extremely warm. So we've got data from both oceans in the southern Indian Ocean and the southern South Atlantic telling the same story, that the Tronian age, which is right here, gets extremely warm. It's interesting that the timing of the cooling is different between the Indian Ocean and the South Atlantic. So it seems like the South Atlantic stays warm longer than 
what happens in the Indian Ocean. So we're going to test this with, with the uh, additional samples with, that we've poured. Then notice we go from temperatures that are really warm with a big difference between the planktic temperatures and the benthic de temperatures. And then the planktic and benthic temperatures converge as we get into the younger sediment at about 70 million years ago. So there's very little difference between the planktics and temperatures, which, which means a very mixed ocean and a much cooler ocean. And it's almost getting to the point where the temperatures are cool enough for at least small ice sheets in Antarctica. And then notice at the end of the Cretaceous, we have a very brief warming event. And this is when there's a big volcanic eruption uh, series in India called the Deccan Volcanism event. And so this Deccan volcanism is pumping CO2 into the atmosphere and causing global warming. And you can see that quite nicely represented the last 300,000 years of the Cretaceous. We, uh, when we measure oxygen isotopes, at the same time we get something called carbon isotopes. And this tells us something about the carbon budget in the ocean. And the difference between planktic and benthic uh, carbon isotopes also has something to do with productivity, and uh, it, it basically is a, a paleoceanographic tool. What's interesting is we have very high gradients between the surface water and the bottom water for both carbon isotopes and oxygen isotopes, which suggest a very layered ocean at this time. And again, contrast that with the very small gradients we have toward the end of the Cretaceous, which suggests a very mixed ocean. So this is a long-term curve from 114 million years ago to 35 million years ago. And Helen, I call this the PETM smackdown curve. Because if you look at the temperatures achieved during the Cretaceous thermal maximum, they're actually much warmer than anything you get at the PETM at high latitudes. Uh, even for the benthics, um, we are on the order of uh, 20 degrees C with the warmest temperatures here, uh, 24 degrees C. Um, so in terms of a mechanism for warming, we've, we seem to have a much hotter greenhouse earth uh, throughout this whole interval from Tronian through Santonian uh, relative to anything that occurs in the Cenozoic. So we've got a hot greenhouse throughout this whole time and then gradual cooling and then it warms up to the PETM, which is a brief hot interval during the early Eocene. And then you see gradual cooling. And then ice sheets form in Antarctica. A continental ice sheet forms right at about 38, uh, 38 million years ago. And this is when we, we get a, a, a very large ice sheet reaching sea level in Antarctica. This is sort of the uh, Del 018 value where ice sheets form very large continental ice sheets, uh, where, where the temperatures are cool enough for large ice sheets. And you can see the Cretaceous temperatures never really get down that cool. We get close right here, but it never gets cool enough to form a large ice sheet. So I, I wanted to uh, ask the question, how do the proxies for CO2 compare with the temperature curve shown here. And we have multiple proxies for estimating carbon dioxide from the Cretaceous. And one is from leaf stomata. And this is what uh, uh, Margaret does here. Um, and a colleague uh, at the Smithsonian is working on this. And a number of people measuring the, the stomata from um, particular leaves that the density of the stomata is relative to the uh, carbon dioxide. The problem is, when we have the warmest temperatures here, we've got very low leaf stomata index values for the Cretaceous. So there's not good correlation for that. Another approach for estimating uh, CO2 is from paleosols of uh, uh, carbonate and measuring the carbon isotopes from the paleosols. And again, uh, the peak of the Tronian, it really doesn't stand out. There's not much data, these circles here, not much data. Uh, so there's not good correlation 
uh, from our, our PCO2 proxies. Um, the other driver for temperature is tectonics. And so the large igneous province eruptions, uh, this, that's what LIP stands for. So magma flux, um, there's no big peak that corresponds with the peak temperatures here. Um, Mid-ocean ridge magma uh, output, also no big peak corresponds. And then the length of subduction zones, when you plot that on a curve, again, there's nothing that stands out that strong, shows a strong connection or correlation uh, to drive the extremely hot climate here. So there's, there's difficulties with the proxies. So diagenesis is one. Um, the leaf stomata, uh, the age resolution is not great where the leaf stomata samples have been ob obtained. And there's uncertainty about the proxies itself. And of course, for the tectonics, with, with subduction, a lot of our record has been subducted, and so we may be missing some of the large igneous province eruptions that took place. And so um, because of the good preservation in both ocean basins, I think we can be say that this is a very reliable signal of extreme warmth. I think the other data just need to catch up, or we may not be able to find the correlation that we, we search for. Nonetheless, uh, this gives good reason to, to, um, to look. So for, for the Cretaceous, we have these sea level changes uh, that have been in the record and published uh, that have considered third order sea level changes, which means they're rapid and that they're of a magnitude that they were quite large. So on the order of 50 to 100 meters sea level change in the Cretaceous. So these have been estimated looking at outcrops of sections in the western interior of U.S. and other locations. And this is a relative sea level curve published in 1987. And Price suggested that there were ice sheet events at each place where there's a star. And so the question is, if we have these extremely warm climates, such as this one and here, can we have ice sheets at this time? So one of the uh, couple of studies that suggested ice sheets during the Cenomanian, which is this time of, of extreme warmth, here's a sea level curve from Andy Gale and others, suggesting a big sea level drop right here. Ken Miller and others suggested New Jersey sea level change right here caused by ice sheets. Both of them said there must have been ice sheets in Antarctica. Uh, we published a curve of oxygen isotopes that su suggested a negative shift which Ken Miller said must be because of an ice sheet. However, Mariah et al. published this curve from dimmer Rise based on oxygen isotopes of planktic foraminifera showing no change in the oxygen isotope values, indicating because ice sheets store oxygen is isotopes in the, the light isotope oxygen 16, with no change in this curve, Mariah et al. said there's no way we could have an ice sheet in Antarctica during the Cenomanian. At Sushi Ando and I and, and a couple other authors restudied this interval and basically we said this positive shift in oxygen isotopes is an artifact of diagenesis or, or change in the preservation. Um, and so we go from good preservation here to bad preservation here and so it's not a real indicator of the oxygen isotope composition of the ocean. It's an artifact. Um, so that pretty much throws out this, the uh, purported Cenomanian ice sheet event. Ken McLeod, myself, and others published this curve from Tanzania. And this is from the Tronian, which is the peak of the ice house. The, these are the benthic data showing different species of benthics and their oxygen isotopes through the Tronian. This is depth of the core drilled in, on land, but it's all marine sediments from foraminifera. And these are the planktic foraminifera. Again, they show very consistent values and insufficient change to suggest any evidence of ice sheets. So then the question is, well, how reliable are these third order sea level events? Uh, Bilal Haq published a Cretaceous curve in 2014, and these are the third order, order events 
that have been suggested to be possible ice sheet events. Uh, Bilal is at the Smithsonian now, and he and I have been working together. And we focused on these two events, these two sea level events, to look at whether or not there's evidence for this change that has been suggested as rapid and synchronous globally. And so this event right here is, is compared for Western Interior, New Jersey Coastal Plain, England, Europe, Egypt, Russian platform. And the question is, is there a sea level event at all places at the same time? And basically, as we went through this, we found there were, there were unconformities, but the basis for correlation and giving the age was very unreliable. And so the error estimates for these ages is, is at least 0.4 million years. And beyond that, there's no certainty that the sea level events are synchronous at all of these places. And so what Blau Hawk has been publishing lately is that a lot of the things that we thought were caused by ice are actually due to tectonics. And it's called dy dynamic topography, very local tectonic changes causing relative sea level change in a basin. And then the other factor is regional climatic factors. And so we are concluding that for much of the mid-Cretaceous to late Cretaceous, these so-called third-order sea level events that were considered glacial eustatic are caused by other factors. So I'm going to sort of summarize this first part of the talk. And um, this time interval, we had warm greenhouse climate throughout the Earth and no evidence of, of ice sheets. Troni, we have the peak temperatures uh, for about 4 million years with extreme warmth, uh, essentially tropical, subtropical temperatures in the pol polar regions. And this warmth lasted until about at least uh, 84 million years ago. No, ev no evidence of polar ice sheets. Timing of the transition to cool greenhouse is a little uncertain. Uh, but we know we have the coolest temperatures within this time for the Cretaceous age. So now's the time if you want to get up and leave, you're welcome. <laughs> the second part of the talk is about the ocean drilling expedition, which is really an effort to fill in the gaps of this climate curve. The expedition was uh, one year ago from right now. We started October 1st. We left Hobart uh, in the Joides Resolution. Uh, we drilled our first site in the Great Australian Bight. And then we drilled four sites uh, in the Mentel Basin off of southwest Australia. And again, to remind you, reconstruction of, of the continents, these are all high latitude sites. So all these sites are at about 60 degrees south. And, and so this is 94 million years ago. And then we wanted the record of when Australia separated from Antarctica and how the paleoceanography was affected by the deep and shallow ocean circulation in this region and how it also affected the deep circulation elsewhere. And so we're looking at a long-term Cretaceous through Cenozoic record of oceanography uh, at, with separation of the Gondwana continents. So we wanted to fill in these gaps so that we can identify the timing of these temperature shifts and see if we can identify the cause of those, those climate changes. We also wanted to look at how the uh, role of productivity, temperature, and circulation changed uh, across what are called oceanic anoxic events. And I'll talk about this a bit more, but basically, these are times when the deep ocean temperature was very, very warm, and the oxygen at the seafloor was used up, and we had preservation of organic matter. And you get deposition of what are called black shales. And these black shales are very widespread worldwide, and that organic matter in the black shales are actually the source of a lot of petroleum, um, particularly in the Middle East. So these black shales have been controversial for 40 years. And our goal was to understand what triggers the deposition of, of these black shales. 
And then, as I mentioned, we want to understand how the deep and intermediate circulation changed as the Gondwana continent separated. We want to look at the uh, oceanographic change of the Mental Basin as the Tasman Sea opened. Uh, looking at this seaway that opened between Australia and Antarctica. And then we also wanted to drill into the volcanic rock underneath all the sediments, get the age of the volcanic rock and understand their history uh, of formation. So here's a reconstruction with a polar projection. Um, actually, at this time, 90 million years ago, land connected Australia and Antarctica. So there was no seaway here, but the seaway opened from the west to the east. And so it opened like a scissors, pulling apart with a deep ocean in the center. And our site is right here. And so nobody has drilled this in deep sea drilling. Um, so we were looking at the history of this Cretaceous seaway. And for the Eocene, you can see how this is opening deeper. And by the late Eocene, we have complete separation and deep circulation between the two continents. So the first site we drilled is Site 1512. And this is on the margin of Australia. Um, and so we drilled this site based on previous drilled wells with the anticipation that we would get down at least into the Cenomanian Age back to about uh, 95 million years ago. Um, it turns out almost all of what we drilled looks like this very homogeneous dark mudstone. Pretty restricted in terms of the plankton, but the calcareous nanofossils yawn, where David Watkins did a great job getting ages all the way through. The planktonic foraminifera, which I was studying uh, and the shipboard scientists were studying, are very sparse and sporadic. Um, but we have enough record, including some, some palynology, that we should get a very nice history of Cretaceous climate change in southern Australia. And what's interesting is some of these intervals are very cyclic. So we have Milankovitch scale cyclicity um, for some intervals, very beautifully cyclic, um, particularly showing up in our natural gamma logs and our magnetic susceptibility. So um, this site is going to be important, particularly for a regional study of Australia and for the study of the opening of that seaway. My particular interest, though, is these sites in the Mentel Basin. The first site that we drilled in Mentel Basin was a redrilling of Site 258. So we went back to the same location where the drill ship was in 1972, and we redrilled we, uh, re that site with much better technology to get much better core recovery. This is the seismic line uh, going from the margin of Australia out to Site 1513. Here is what we drilled. And we actually bottomed out in the volcanic basalt. We got 80 meters of, of basalt at this site. But you can see the thick pile of sediment, uh, which goes from uh, we had a bit of the Miocene to recent. And then we jumped into the Cretaceous, early Campanian, uh, down into the Albion. And that's what's shown here. So here we've got the Miocene, mid-Miocene to recent. And then there's a big unconformity. And we jump into the Cretaceous. Uh, we've got a beautiful Cenomanian Troni boundary, which is this. And this is that time when we get the shift in climate to the extreme warmth. And then we get very long sequence of dark mudstones, uh, very homogeneous, with very few plank planktic foraminifera. But the great thing is the preservation is good all the way down to here. And so with good preservation of the shells, we're going to get a very good paleo temperature record all the way down into the middle Albion. So we consider this expedition a great success. Here's our first black shale. You can see the dark, um, dark um, black shale right here. This is at the Cenomanian Turonian boundary. We actually went and redrilled this site. And uh, so we've got two copies across the Cenomanian Troni boundary that we're sampling. And one of the goals is to look at something called osmium isotopes 
through this sequence. Uh, osmium isotopes, the ratios of osmium isotopes, uh, change when there's volcanism. <clears throat> and so a colleague in Japan, Junashiro Kuroda, will be looking to see if there's a shift in osmium isotopes just at the time of the black shales. And if there is, that will tell us that volcanic eruptions triggered the global warming across this interval. Uh, you can see we've got very nice natural gamma records, uh, beautiful logging records um, from shipboard analysis as well as uh, doing logging um, of the whole. And, uh, plus we have a very nice age model to constrain the ages of all the samples. So the first site was a great success. Um, the second site was on the northern margin of the Mentel Basin. It was also deeper. So it's about 800 meters deeper um, than the first site. And by getting deeper, of course, we're going to get a, a deeper water signal of what the uh, uh, deep ocean was doing uh, during the history of the opening of the Tasman Sea, as well as the spreading of Kerguelen Plateau away from Australia. We expected to have a big unconformity, again, between the Miocene and the Cretaceous. But to our surprise, we got a beautiful paleogene sequence all the way down, including a complete Cretaceous paleogene boundary. And so we hit all the highlights, Helen. Eocene and Ligocene boundary. We got the mid Eocene climatic optimum, early Eocene climatic optimum, the PETM, and a Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. Um, then we have an unconformity here, um, and we have a beautiful uh, Santonian sequence, and then a very weird Sedimentian Tronian boundary I'll show, and then we get late Albion sediments. So we have two boreholes that overlap this part of the record, which is the Cretaceous part. And um, <clears throat> very nice uh, logging, as well as uh, shipboard physical properties and natural gamma data, and a very good age model uh, showing the ages going down from Miocene to the Albion. Um, core recovery, I should mention. The white represents unrecovered core. And so the composite record, particularly across the uh, Cinemanian Tronian boundary interval, is, is 100%. But well, we got this very weird sediment as we got to the Cinemanian Tronian boundary. So we had about 94 million years. We got this very swirly, beautiful, swishy sediment with black shales all mixed up. My colleague Richard Hobbs, the other co chief, I was a co chief, and then Richard Hobbs was the other co chief. He's a geophysicist. He pulled up the seismic line across this part of the basin, and he looked at all the uh, instability here. Even though this is a one and a half degree slope, um, this seems to be a big slip or a decolement, meaning the sediments slid down the slope. And so this is from sliding of the sediments. Everything just above this core is in place. It all slid in place. We don't know just when it slid. And then everything below is fine. Um, so it's very weird. Um, it's very unfortunate, too, that the interval we were after, Sentimentian Trony Boundary, is all mixed up and we can't really study it to get the detailed record we want. Nonetheless, Helen, here's our uh, Posse Loculata. This is an early Danian marker a species described from New Zealand just above the Cretaceous tertiary boundary extinction. This is the boundary level uh, constrained by planktic foraminifera and calcareous nanofossils with a bit of bio bioturbation, uh, but it's, it's a very complete boundary. And here are the basalts that we recovered. The basalts are fresh enough that we should get some very good ra radiometric dating to determine the age of when those basalts erupted. And also, some of those basalts were red colored, which means they were subaerial, which means they were erupted above uh, the uh, sea level. So then, the shallowest site was 1515, right on the margin of Australia. The goal there was to date these highly dipping sediments. And we also wanted to find out what these sediments' ages were here and get the whole history of the shallower water uh, deposition of Cenozoic through Cretaceous. 
Turns out there's a lot of loose sand in these sediments, and so the white dominates the core recovery. In other words, we had very, very low core recovery. I think it's average 15% because of these sands. So poor recovery, but the intervals that we recovered were enough to provide age control. Um, and so we, we have these age windows. For all of this interval, the age control is going to be determined by palynology. And I'll talk to Vivi about maybe whether she would get some samples to help, help with some of this. Um, so for those who were trying to understand the tectonic history of the margin, they were very happy, even with this poor core recovery. There were coals. We got coals down here. There's also coal down here. And the age we got from plinomorphs in samples from right here suggests Jurassic age. And so this helps determine the timing of the tectonics. And, and we know at least the dipping beds are older than Jurassic. The last site we drilled, 1516, is shown here. And it's to the south of the site uh, 1513 that we I talked about earlier. This is the record we got. Uh, these are the seismic, uh, very stable stratigraphy all the way down. We have a Cenozoic record. I'll talk about beautiful sediment and Trony boundary. And then we get back into the Albion Shales again. Um, you can see 100% recovery for the first part, which is Cenozoic with the nonconformity uh, in the Oligocene, brief interval of the Eocene, and then we jump into the Cretaceous down here. Our sedimentary trony boundary is down here. So we have two copies of the centimeter turning boundary at two holes and 100% recovery at the second hole. So we're very excited about this. Um, the first hole we got the black shale. The black shale was at the bottom of the core. And you can see there's actually not just one black shale. There's a thick one. There's another black shale and another black shale. This interval right here is very carbonate poor. So there's almost no calcareous nanofossils or foraminifera, which is weird. Um, it seems to be very silicious, full of silica, which suggests high productivity of silicious plankton, which suggests this was driven by volcanism and high productivity to cause the black shales. But we wanted another copy of the core. And David Watkins and Gabriel are very happy because Here's the black shale in the middle of the core, again with the black shale here, another black shale here. And here's close-ups. So these are laminated, meaning there were no organisms burrowing the sediments to mix the sediments up. So there's no oxygen on the seafloor at this time. So a very weird time when the ocean goes anoxic. So as I mentioned, there have been controversy about what causes these black shales. And one is the stagnation model, where basically you have no ocean circulation and no replenishing of oxygen in the deep water. The other model is called the productivity model, which suggests you have nutrients getting into the ocean, lots of plankton productivity, lots of organic matter that sinks to the seafloor. That organic matter overwhelms the oxygen on the seafloor, and you get the black shale deposition from that. And so, like I said, we're going to use os osmium isotopes to determine whether the volcanism is the trigger. And then, above and below the black shale intervals, we'll have constraints on the temperatures and how they change across this boundary interval. And of course, we're also going to look at the biotic changes um, to see how the ocean biota were, biota were affected um, by this warming. So to summarize all the different sites we drilled, we've got these critical intervals uh, recovered. Nice sedimentary trony boundary here, and another beautiful sedimentary trony boundary uh, at, sorry, here, 1516. And then at 1514, we've got this beautiful, unexpected paleogene record with lots of critical intervals. It'll be studied in great detail. So Kirsty Edgar's doing this work. You probably know that, Ellen. Um, so actually, we came off the ship achieving 
more than we expected for the original objectives of the expedition. Some of which will be some detailed reconstructions of the uh, ocean circulation here because we have beautiful cyclostratigraphy in the Miocene uh, that we didn't expect to get. That's going to tell us a lot about uh, changes in the climate and, and oceanography. So in May, we went and sampled the core. We took over 16,000 samples from all the cores that, that were obtained. Um, we're now in the middle of doing a lot of laboratory analyses, and then we are, um, whoops. So we're doing the, the age constraints, the biostrophy, and then all the chemical analyses and the sedimentology is happening now. And then in May of 2019, we'll meet in, in Kanzawa, and whole shipboard and shore-based team We'll discuss results up till then. We'll continue our collaborative discussions, and then um, we'll have papers being published uh, from that point forward. So with that, I'll end with some uh, pretty photos from the drill ship, and um, be glad to take any questions if you have. Um, thank you. Discovery. National um, cooperation between many countries and to which Sweden um, pays into a European consortium. So it's, uh, it's hugely productive and there's a number of people in uh, the Stockholm University community involved with this. So at that note, I'll take any questions. Uh, Larry. Thanks. That was re really great. It looks like the highest re the highest resolution and highest fidelity record you showed us, particularly the first uh, site, was the natural gamma log. Yeah. What's it mean? What, what's it showing you? Uh, so natural gamma is, I guess, thorium. So actually, Matt knows this better than me. So I think it's potassium and thorium elements in the cores, and um, it's basically a weathering product. So it might be tied to the clays. Maybe, Matt, if you want to. So you know more about natural gamma, what drives natural gamma better than me. Yes, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there is. And so it's really showing changes in weathering patterns. And so it might be sort of a hydrologic cycle effect. So when we have these, these Milankovitch variations on a very regular cycle, um, I think 400,000 years and 100,000 years is what we were seeing, um, is telling something about the climatic cyclicity and weathering of the clays through those climate cycles. And so some, sometimes they're beautifully attenuated and they show up in, in the uh, color reflectance tied to the natural gamma and the um, other physical properties. And so we've got uh, people that are specifically looking and teasing out that record. It should be really interesting as we pull that out. Yes, Aaron. <clears throat> These very high temperatures in the Turonian, were they mean annual temperatures or was it austral summer temperatures? Yeah. So you know, planktic forams have a seasonal cycle of when they're most abundant. And so some reproduce in the spring, some reproduce in the summer. For these things, you never know when they're reproducing because they're all extinct. Um, I think you can assume they might be summer maxima. Um, but when you consider the benthic temperatures, those are going to be averaged. And so the fact that we're getting values of minus 2.2 .2 per mil, minus 2.6 per mil, consistently for different multiple species of benthic foraminifera suggests those deep waters are really, really warm consistently through the Turonian. 
Uh, so our peak values are right in the early to middle Turonian. So like I said, 2.6, minus 2.6, 2.2. But they stay around minus 2 per mil, minus 1.8 per mil, all the way through this Antonian. So this is a really long time for extreme warmth. And to sustain that extreme warmth, you've got to keep pumping CO2 into the atmosphere because it's constantly getting buried. And so if you're pulling out the CO2, it should be cooling. So you have to have another source of CO2 that's keeping the climate warm. And this is what we're looking for. Do we have sources that can explain uh, how this, this uh, high CO2 Earth is maintained? Stefan. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, his name Bill Hay recently put forward the idea that in the Cretaceous you had huge lowlands because there were virtually no mount well, well, no mountains compared to nowadays world, and that in these lowlands you could store a huge amount of fresh water. Actually, well. You could store a huge amount of water, which A, would produce water vapor, which is a good greenhouse gas, and B, it could be responsible for, for um, sea level changes. Because for, for some reasons, I mean, sometimes the water could go back to the ocean, and sometimes it could just be stored in huge lakes or meandering rivers. Can you comment on that? Sure. <clears throat> so, for one thing, I, I think the hydrological cycle was very cranked up during this time. So you imagine warming the ocean surface to 28 degrees C or warmer, you're going to get lots of huge storms, which is going to move lots of precipitation. And so I think continental interiors had lots of rainfall. Um, I know that Bill Hayes' thesis is based on his interpretation of somebody's publication on a padasaurus, the big sauropods. And the only way to support those big sauropods is for them to sort of hang out in lots of water. And not everybody agrees with that interpretation. Um, it's also based on how else do you change sea level unless you're storing it on land. Talking to Bill, Bill Hawk, Bilal Hawk, he still thinks that's a very small percent of the sea level curve because the volumes still won't add up for groundwater storage. Um, so I'll let the professionals on sea level fight that out. Um, I was just skeptical on the sauropod story, <laughs> so, talking to my dinosaur colleagues. Um, but one of the neat things Bill Hayes done is remind us that the Cretaceous world was completely different from today. And in one of his publications, he talks about the eddy ocean and the fact that we don't have the normal Haley cells, uh, Hadley cell circulation that we assume. And he thinks there's just lots of eddy cells that are moving this moisture and moving the, uh, the temperatures and making it much more equable between low and high latitudes. So he's got some really cool ideas. I'm not quite on board with, with that one, but maybe there will be more evidence for it. Uh, more of a comment. I'm Thank you for a great talk, and uh, I'm always envious to see such high-resolution data, of course. I just want to uh, comment that um, I uh, was a co-author on a paper by Chris Mays, who's somewhere here in the audience, uh, <clears throat> a record from the uh, Chatham Islands, which was about 70 to 80 degrees south mm -hmm. during this time. And we have, unfortunately, just one interval, but it's in the late uh, Cinomanian where we reconstructed CO2 using uh, ginkgoitis variances, oh, wow. which is kind of the gold standard. Ginkgos are the gold sure, standard yeah. for CO2 reconstruction. And we found concentrations of between 1150 and 1350 ppm. Okay. So I'm hoping you might add that to your... <laughs> yeah, so uh, I use a curve compiled in uh, Nature Communications. Author's name I'm forgetting. Bang. Thank you. So, um, and I, I, that must not have been on that curve because yeah, you know, that's that from really 2016 and the paper is from 2015 yeah, so, so he when we probably talk, missed I, it I like that you know that reference that that sounds really good was that with Chris Hollis also okay yeah excellent
right? You know, <clears throat> what we go by is a general assumption that I think is pretty reasonable, and that is if you're going to have normal open ocean plankton, you're going to have pretty much normal open ocean marine salinity. And um, so the salinity itself, I think, whether it's 33 PPT or plus or minus a few, hard to say. I think the big unknown is the isotopic comp composition of the ocean for this time and our assumptions for estimating the temperatures uh, of the Cretaceous. Um, the modelers for the isotopic composition um, assume sort of relative weathering and sort of a weather, a, a relative cycle of, of um, um, mixture between terrestrial sources and ocean mixing and say that ocean salinity of the Cretaceous is really no different than today. So I, I sort of can only go by those models and those assumptions. Um, and it's something we need to keep in the back of our mind that um, is this a safe assumption? But the reality is that we're dealing with, again, benthic foraminifera that are representative of a very long-term mixed ocean record. And so even if you don't believe the really warm values of the planktics, um, which seem completely unreasonable, and I would say there's a salinity factor for the high latitudes, so there's Rayleigh fractionation, which is going to distill out the oxygen 18 so that you get more oxygen 16 in the high latitudes. So that's an effect in the plankton. And then there's, there's probably a salinity factor as well because of higher precipitation at high latitudes. So I agree for the planktics, we're probably overestimating the temperatures. Um, still the benthics, that's I think what you really can trust in terms of a long-term uh, temperature history of the Earth. And that's consistent. The fact that it's consistent in both ocean basins reinforces our uh, determination that this is an extreme, a switch to an extremely hot greenhouse climate. And the terrestrial record, yes, right, right. Yeah, I mean, good question. I mean, we don't have control on that. And one of the questions you have to ask is why would there be Assuming there's an abrupt shift to the sedimentary and tronin boundary, why would there be a, a very abrupt increase in methane at that time? The easy explanation is sudden large volume volcanism causing CO2 to, to pump into the atmosphere. Um, I don't know what the source of a sudden eruption of methane would be unless all the dinosaurs suddenly started passing gas at the same time uh, in greater volumes than ever before. So. So, yeah, so the hydrologic cycle would have to switch uh, to have storage and then sudden release. Um, so it, I think all of our assumptions need to sort of be, get put on the table and everything needs to be questioned. And questions like this are also worth pursuing. The challenge is figuring out what are the proxies to come up with reasonable uh, interpretations uh, that will fit with our fossil and sediment record. Great question. So, <laughs> you know, as a simple-minded paleontologist who does some isotopes, I can only go by what the modelers say. And the climate modelers for the Cretaceous and the, and the Cenozoic um, assume that the primary driver is CO2. Uh, the other factors are sea level, how much of the continent is flooded by water in the ocean, um, vegetation, 
in vegetation cover at high latitudes, and position of the continents. But CO2, according to the modelers, is the main driver. What sun cycles would do and how they would affect this, I really don't know. And whether or not sun cycles could affect this, I haven't talked to the astronomy community to just know if this needs to enter into our thinking. Um, so yeah, I, I can't answer that question. Again, I think we need to put everything on the table and just question all of our assumptions. All right. Thanks.